Thomas, for the really nice introduction and also for you know, taking care of organizing this whole series of lectures and also for allowing me the pleasure of, of occupying the math colloquium with linguistics. So, <laughs> I'm, well, the, I, I am, since it is how, after all, the math colloquium, so I am going to talk about mathematical structures in generative linguistics. So, so most of the audience here is, I assume, you know, mostly mathematicians, although there are several linguists in uh, attendance. So, but I will not attempt to go into, you know, introducing or explaining linguistics as a general discipline or even generative linguistics, although I'll do, I will say something about the history of this subject and some of the questions that this subject deals with. But I will focus on what has been, you know, uh, throughout the history of this subject, what has been the role of mathematics, and you know, what I see the role of mathematics as being you know, right now, as where, where the subject stands at this, at this point in time. And so my perspective on the matter is uh, based on the fact that you know, during this last year, I sort of you know, spent you know, essentially all my time working on, on this project that is joined with Noam Chomsky and Robert Berwick. And uh, we have three papers there, and all the, these three papers are you know, at this point combined in a, in a monograph that covers some additional background and stuff, and that is going to appear with, with MIT Press. And um, so I want to you know, give a little bit. Uh, so for those of you that have been at my lectures yesterday, at my lecture yesterday, there's going to be a little bit of overlap with what I said there because you know, I'm giving these three lectures, but I'm not assuming that you know, the audience is going to be the same over all three of them. So you will. See, so if you have been at the lecture yesterday, you will see some slides you know, coming up again in this lecture. And okay, you know, be patient with that. So I, you know, a very, a very brief history of generative linguistics. So, of course, I'm not going to do justice to the fact that there's, there's been contributions from a lot of people working in this field, but I want to emphasize that this is you know, a field that was you know, initiated and developed by Noam Chomsky over the course of seven decades, and you know, I just made the point yesterday that it's very unusual to have you know, a field of science where you know, the same person kept contributing major breakthrough over the span of 70 years. And uh, the the history, as I will I will get into a little bit more in a moment, you know, started out in the 1950s and you know, through the 1950s and, and 60s, it sort of focused on a very mathematical aspect, which actually gave rise to the the, the theory of formal languages, which is a, a part of mathematics and uh, it has applications not just to linguistics, but you know, to theoretical computer science and and other other disciplines at this point. And this kind of perspective sort of evolved over time into slightly different ways of thinking about how to model language, and uh, in particular syntax. And that's the main focus of this, um, this approach, or at least the main focus that I will be dealing with. And you know, the next kind of you know, structure that, that you know, have been introduced were transformational grammars. And then, you know, starting in the 1980s, was a further you know, revision of this uh, old model, what, what went under the name of government and binding theory, or you know, principles and parameters. And I'm, I'm going to skip parts of the story. I, I will show you. I will show something about the, the beginning phase, and, and the, the role the mathematics played at that time. And then I will zoom, you know, all the way down to the most recent uh, developments, which have been basically the work of the of the past ten years. And this uh, model, the specific model of linguistics, which is called merge and the strong minimalist thesis. And, and that is the work that, I, that I've been you know, uh, dealing with. So, and I, I will focus then for the, for the rest of the talk on that particular part of the story. So there's a lot of things that I will, of course, skip over. It's not an historical talk, but I will try to give a little bit of a historical perspective. And the, in a sense, the goal of this whole thing that, that you know, Chomsky called this a generative enterprise is, uh, 
understanding language as a structure in the same way as we mean in mathematics for the saying that something is a structure. And to actually you know, study it with pretty much the same mindset and methods that we use in mathematics to study various kinds of structures. And uh, you know, the, the idea behind this is that, of course, there are many different languages right, in, in the world, and they, their syntax and also other aspects of the language are structured differently, but these differences are not random. They are highly structured and they are highly constrained. And you know, it, it is sort of clear that when one starts to model what is happening, there is like a, a core computational mechanism of syntax that is common to all languages. And then there's like some kind of specializations that are language dependent and where the, the different kind of uh, aspects of syntax as they, 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 you know, we detect in differences between various languages actually manifest themselves. But in some sense, one can kind of separate these two, these two parts of the story and just look at the computational mechanism, the core computational mechanisms that's you know, language independent by itself and the externalization into the different languages as a, as a separate step. And so that is part of what is the, the model, current model is trying to do. So the, the early developments in, um, you know, in, in the, as I said, you know, in, the, in the 50s and 60s, you know, the, the, the modeling of syntax was based on the concept of formal languages. And so formal language describes certain strings of words or strings of symbols that are produced by a computational mechanism, and usually some kind of automaton. And you know, different classes of formal languages can be computed by different classes of automata. We'll say that in a moment, there's one of the early theorems in this, uh, in this matter is called the Chomsky hierarchy, and exactly determines like which classes of formal languages correspond to which kind of uh, computational you know, class of automata. And one, one thing that this, this uh, distinction between different classes of formal language does for you is that it distinguishes between different types of recursions that are uh, available in, uh, in the formal language. So this is an important point. I mean, <laughs> we had some, some heated discussions over dinner <laughs> about this. But uh, in one, one important aspect of uh, language as a computational machine is that it allows for recursions. And of course, this is, you can easily see what I mean by that because, for example, in any language, let's say in English, you can help someone, help someone, help someone, help someone. And you know, of course, you know, in, 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 in real life, you will not iterate this more. You know, it becomes funny after the sort of third iteration, and you will not use it you know, beyond much more than that. But you know, your brain immediately understands that this recursion can arbitrarily continue. And it immediately understands that it continues to be grammatically correct. It could be funny, but it, it, won't, it won't stop being grammatically correct between the 43rd and the 44th iteration. And you know, it will continue to be meaningful, you know, even though, again, it can be funny, it can be strange, but it, cannot, it will not be you know, known parsable. It, it will still be correct. So, and, and you can cook up many examples of such recursions. I'll show an interesting example in a, in a moment. So, you no, know, part of the, the idea is, you know, is that the, the existence of these recursions are, in a sense, you know, a, a, something that reveals the fact that there is an interesting non-trivial computational process going on. Okay, so you know, the, these formal languages, however, are, are a pure, in a sense, are, are a mathematical theory that adapts to things that are not human languages. So you can obtain formal languages while they correspond to programming languages, but for example, you know, you, if you take a presentation of a discrete group and, and you look at the trivial words, so all the, all the words that are, that are the identity in the, in the group, that is a formal language. 
and you know, the, which class that belongs to is telling you specific properties about the group. So for example, there is, there is an interesting you know, kind of set of examples that have this algebraic nature, and of course those don't correspond to to languages that humans speak. I mean, you no. Know, okay, for programming languages, you can kind of imagine that someone could speak Fortran. I mean, I, I'm, I work at Caltech, so I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but even there, I mean, nobody will speak SL2Z. So <laughs> there, there's a lot of stuff in formal languages that is not human languages, and that's important to keep in mind. But the question is, is there a class of formal languages that actually captures what you see in human languages? Okay. All right, so this was one of the early, early questions. So what is a formal language? Okay, you define it as a, you know, a certain set of non-terminal and terminal symbols, some start symbol, and some rewriting system, some production rules, and a language is whatever is obtained as a chain of terminal symbols after repeatedly applying your production rules. So when you say it like this, it maybe looks you know, a little bit non, non, not completely transparent, but of course you can really see that you know, it looks very much like describing a path on some kind of direct graph or, or something of the sort. And in fact, it, it's, uh, it, to some extent, this is one way that you can think about what is happening here, and let's say that more in, uh, in a moment. But so let's make an example, right? Very simple example. Here's your, your grammar of a formal language, and you have a starting symbol, and, and then you have these kind of rules that you can apply. And, and here's an example of applying all these, all these rules. You start with a symbol, then you make one step, two step, three step, and now you've reached all terminal symbols, so nothing continues beyond that. And now you read off at the, what you have obtained as a, as a sequence, so you read off this A, A, B, B, A, A sequence. So that is a word in the language that is generated by this, this formal grammar. Yeah. So that's, yeah. I don't understand, so one of your rules is A goes to S, S. Yeah. And one of your rules is A goes to B, A. So, I, so you have a- A goes to S, S show up in this. No, in, in, in this example, does it, so you, it's not like you have to use all the derivations that you, oh, you have. You have to use some of them, okay. right? Yeah. So here you're using the first one, right? S go to A, 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 capital A, S, and then you're using A goes to S, B, A, and you're going, yeah. So as long as you're applying some of the, and then, and then it stops when you reach only terminals, and then you get a word, a, a sentence that is you know, part of your language. Okay. All right, so. The terminal, the terminal symbols in this? Yeah, so this little a and little b are the terminal, are the terminal symbols. So once you get there, you, you, know, you don't continue. That's, yeah. Okay, so, so here's what I mentioned about this, uh, this early theorem. You know, there's, uh, there are three, four types of, uh, of formal languages. The most restrictive type is these regular grammars, and, and there's, a, there's a corresponding class of automata that can compute this type of languages, and these are finite state automata. That's a very restrictive kind of automata. These really are paths on a direct graph. And uh, there's a, there's a, the context-free grammars that correspond to a larger class of automata, which are these, well, popularly known deterministic push-down stack automata. There's context-sensitive grammars that are a sort of slightly more restrictive type of Turing machines that call linear bounded automaton. And then the largest class is just computable. It's just something that's computable by a Turing machine. Okay. So uh, what, it, what this means, right? So what, it, what is this context-free versus context-sensitive uh, distinction? Well, context-free means that you have this kind of rules and you can apply them wherever, wherever these symbols occur. And the, the context sensitive means that you can apply them only when your symbol occurs in a certain context. Okay. And uh, so one of the first kind of conjectures in the, in the field was that context-free languages would be the right class of, uh, of, fi of uh, no, formal languages that would capture the natural languages, or the human languages. 
and uh, and of course they capture other things that are not for human languages, including some of these group things. But um, but it was sort of you know, conjectured that this would be enough to capture the grammar of uh, of human languages. So the, this is more than the the most restrictive class, right? so this context-free is, is this type two. The regular grammars, the most restrictive ones, those are, it's not difficult to see that they're not enough. And those, the most restrictive ones, are the, the ones that are computed by this finite state automata, so they're basically like Markov processes. And, and those, it, it sort of was you know, very early on understood that they're not you know, rich enough to, to you know, capture aspects of human syntax. But these ones, the context-free grammars, are the ones that are computed by this push-down stack automata, which you can still think of as, as like paths on a graph, but where your transition rules are allowed to use you know, memory in a stack, except that you, you can only access what is at the top of the stack. And so you can take out and put into the stack, but you cannot reach sort of at the, at, at the bottom. And uh, so this, this context-free seemed like a good, you know, much more expressive class of languages. And so these are, these are examples of what I mean by the fact that these different classes of formal languages capture different kinds of recursions. So the, the, the regular languages, the most restrictive ones that are computed by finite state automata, would, for example, be able to produce an infinite recursion of this form. So you have, say, two symbols, 0 and 1, around now as a terminal. So it means that everything that this language produces is, is a string of zeros and ones. And, and this, is, this production rule is capable of producing strings that have some number of zeros, all one after the other, followed by some number of ones, all one after the other. But these two, how many zeros and how many ones you have is not uh, related. So you could have an arbitrary number of zeros and an arbitrary number of ones. But for example, if you want to produce strings where the number of zeros is always equal to the number of ones, that cannot be done by one of these finite state automata because you have to somehow keep a memory of how many steps you've done. And you don't have any memory storage in this finite set automata. But with this pushed out set automata, you can do that. And so there is a context-free derivation that allows you to get this kind of recursion. So this is an example of you know, different, different recursions that are captured by this type of computation. So the, the context-sensitive ones, for example, would allow you to get more, more uh, complicated recursions, for example, this, this, this kind. Okay. So in a sense, the question of whether um, one or another class of these uh, type of automata, or this type of formal languages, would be rich enough to capture human languages is a question about what type of recursions are possible in human languages. You can, you can think of it in those terms. And it turns out that you know, there are examples of uh, constructions in human languages that are not um, no recursions in human languages that are not uh, captured by context-free grammars. So the first two examples that were discussed, one by Nini Oibrex, was Dutch, the uh, first language that has a recursion that's not uh, producible by, by context-free grammars, and, and uh, you know, Schubert kind of captured the same, the same feature in, uh, in Swiss German. And the kind of recursion that, that these two languages exhibit is called the cross serial subordinate, also cross serial recursion. And uh, so it, it's built like this. So let, let me yeah, name, just give you the example. So here, here is the, the formal picture of what type, what this recursion would be. So you have iterations, you know, that cross each other in, in so you have recursions that cross each other in, in a path like this. And, and this is kind of like typical example of something that's not, not captured by, by a context-free case. And, <clears throat> So how does that happen? Well, so you, you want to build a sentence that, that looks like this string that I, that I wrote up here, where you know, the, the 
like A, A and C N are part of one recursion, and B M D M are part of another one that cross each other. And so the idea of how you build this recursion is exactly the example I gave. So you you can help someone, help someone, help someone or you can ask someone to ask someone to ask someone, right? So now if I want to combine these two in English, I can say that I would ask someone to help someone, or I can ask someone to ask someone to help someone to help someone, but they will not cross each other. But if you try to form the same sentence in Dutch or in Swiss German, they would have to cross each other. So it's, uh, it's exactly this kind of recursion that, that you see in these examples here. So, Conclusion of the story, context free is too small, content sensitive is too large. And so, okay, the question at the time was, is there some in between this kind of mild, mildly context sensitive class of grammars? Like uh, examples are three adjoining grammars, multiple context free grammars, there are MG grammars, other things, there are various classes of, of formal languages that are, are kind of larger than context free, but not as huge as, as the context sensitive class. Okay, so fine. However, at this point, I want to jump forward by by a lot of by by a big chunk of time. But uh, there's been you know a kind of shift that was sort of more gradual than what I'm showing here, but a kind of shift of perspective in how one thinks about these questions, and for various reasons. So one reason is that. When you try to model aspects of syntax of human languages by these these formal formal languages, oh yes, sorry. I, I just had a question on the last slide you said. Uh, yeah, so let, let, let me get back. Uh, okay. Large. Isn't I mean it's such a general characterization when you expect everything to be too large. I mean there are like I mean a few thousand languages and then like this, any abstract mathematical structure you will have. No. Okay. So it's not the point. Is not like how many formal languages you have in a given class, right? Of course, it may, even in the regular grammars, so okay, any 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 finite no, direct graph would be would be one, right? So of course you have a lot. The the point is that you know what is the smallest class that captures all the phenomena that you expect to see in the syntax of human languages. So of course this class will inevitably include a lot of stuff that is not human languages, like for example things that are coming from presentations of groups, right? There will be in, in, in all of these classes, depending on which kind of group you use. And uh, you know, they, so and, and so there will be a lot of other stuff. So the point is not to say that you want a class that will correspond exactly to the human languages, but you want to sort of understand what is the smallest class that will be expressive enough to capture the kind of things that you encounter in human languages. I see. Is it? Yeah. I was going to ask. Is it like you would think to say that something's too large, you have to check every language? Yeah, exactly. So that's that's part of you know that's part of the of the problem, right? So as I as I showed, you know, it, it took a while to like come up with an example, so a counter example to this this context free conjecture, and so a, a counter example means exhibiting a language and a particular syntactic construction that you know violates your hypothesis, right? So of course, you no. Know, data about so syntax is a, is a very robust property of language. And, but it's also one that is sort of much more complex than you know, collecting lexicon or so if you if you are an actual field you no know, linguist who is you no know, trying to get data about you know the syntax of a lot of languages this you know there are there are databases of for example yeah syntactic parameters so things that they kind of capture the differences in syntactic constructions among world languages and they are they are a lot of a lot of really hard work, right, to collect this data. So, of course, this is part of uh, part of the problem, right? If you formulate a question like this, how how do you know that your your conjecture, you you yeah, you you have a conjecture, and you might you know discover you know, the language that that is the counterexample to that conjecture, right? <laughs> so, so I'm wondering how difficult is the problem of recognizing a context-free language, and uh, in particular, are context-free languages known to be in P? A, a context free language? Are they known to be in P? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think so. I think so. Yeah. Is that correct, right? Yeah. 
depends on the specific parsing problem you look at. But yeah, they all have the property of being polynomially parsable. And like deciding membership in the language hence is also going to be like in P because you really check do you have a parse for a string. Yeah, so you know, recognizing you know, like a mem if, if, if a certain string belongs to a language or not, when I mean, you can see that this, this is computationally problematic, right? It can be because you can have, as I was saying, one, one way to produce formal languages is to take a presentation of, of presentation of a group and take the words that are the identity in the group. But this is like the word problem. Okay, so, you know, it, yeah, exactly. So, but of course it depends like what questions you're asking in terms of what you're trying to compute. For example, the, the, here the kind of questions that one is looking at is whether a certain recursion is realizable as, a, as part of a, of a certain class of languages, which is a slightly different question from you know, identifying membership. Okay, I, I think I'm confused about something, but we'll okay. talk after. Okay. <laughs> All right. So anyway, anyway, no. The, the point I want to make is that because so this was like the the sort of you know, earlier approach to how to try to model syntax. But one one point, one problem with this is that if you try to model even some small part of, of syntactic construction of human languages using using formal languages, you get like a lot of these derivation rules, a lot of you know, a very like comp complicated computational you know, model for for you know, the, the the aspects of syntax that I'm trying to describe. And and this is sort of not so so satisfactory as as an idea because for various reasons. But for example, you know if you think in terms of uh, biology, like language is a fairly recent Evolutionary development compared to I don't know vision or you no know, other other you know cognitive uh, aspects of, of the human brain, and so because it, it historically you know uh, in in in, in uh, you know, evolutionary time, this development happened in in a very short term in in, in evolutionary you know, perspective. It has to depend on something fairly simple that has to happen. So this computational mechanism of syntax that we sort of you know, try to argue is the basic uh, structure that is necessary for the production of language has to depend on something that's fairly simple and, and has to be you know, based on some, some very you know, basic you know, structure that doesn't have to, shouldn't be like depending on an enormous number of complicated rules that have to be you know a, a, that, that pile up for more and more structural syntax that you're trying to describe. So this is one of one of the arguments. And also, you know, there's a there, there, well, okay, there, there's several other there's several other viewpoints. Maybe I shouldn't go too much into that. But okay, so one one big part of this shift in perspective is the fact that you know when you think in terms of formal languages what you are looking at is strings of symbols and you and you want to say whether the strings of symbols which you think of as sentences belong to a certain language or not are produced by a certain kind of uh, automaton or or not you know contains certain kind of recursions or not but so it, the perspective in in this way is to think of uh, of language as as strings of symbols, you know, like this, some, some string of, of numbers, or, or, or some other kind of symbols. <clears throat> but this somehow doesn't correspond to what one can observe about the way that people use language, in the sense that you know, we, when we are parsing a sentence, we immediately recognize that elements that are pretty far away in the, in the linear ordering of the words in your sentence are much more closely related in terms of structure of the, of the sentence than elements that happen to be nearby 
in the ordering of the words. And so what we are perceiving you know, and what we are dealing with in, in computational terms is not the string, is some kind of structure behind the string that has not so much to do with the, the actual ordering of words in your sentence, but with structural relations between them. And so, in a sense, the picture is that the way we should think of sentences in, in a language is, or in, in language as this kind of you know, uh, a priori computational mechanism that is not yet embodied in one particular language is as like this kind of more colder mobile sculptures where you know you have a tree that's sort of hanging by the root and it's sort of freely you know floating around without being embedded in the plane so the the leaves don't have a linear ordering that comes from a planar embedding but what you all that you see are the structural the structural relation, the structural ordering, like what is close to what in terms of the structure of the tree, not in terms of the of the ordering of the leaves. And so, one, one text or the corpus of all texts, or, or what? yeah, think of it as one sentence. Just, yeah, just you know, in the sense that you know, I'm thinking about syntax as the basic structure of language that I'm looking at, which is sort of like the large scale structure of a language, right? And so at that level, the unit of measure is the sentence. Like, I mean, if you want, there's like different levels of, uh, of scale in, in linguistics. There's like phonology, where it's sort of the small scale structure of, of space time, the small space structure of language, where you know, you're looking at units of sound as the basic measuring units. There's morphology, where you're looking at individual words as the, as the, you know, the main units. And then the syntax, where you're looking at sentences as the main unit. So you might as well think that this is a sentence. Okay. So, so what I mean by by this, by you no know, structures, right? Okay, here here's an example. Yeah, if I take take this uh, sentence, it's a famous Groucho Marx joke. Oh, I, I shot an elephant in my pajamas. What it was doing in my pajamas, I'll never know. So, and it's funny. And the reason why it's funny is because, yeah, it is conflating these two different structures. So the same string of words is not the point. The point is not the string of words, it's the point is the, the structures. And so you can yeah, make many examples like this. So this, this is you know, the sense in which we perceive the structural relations and we do not the proximity relation in the ordering of words. And <clears throat> Okay, so what is the point of view with this? Then, so this, the, now I'm, I'm sort of focusing in on this uh, recent, most recent model of the degenerative process of syntax. So there's a key operation, which is structure formation, just the basic structure formation operation, which is the one that produces the trees, which are your, your hierarchical structures that you know, is the, gives you these syntactic objects which we think of as sentences. And uh, these are non-planar, you know, binary rooted trees. And non-planar because I am sort of intentionally staying away from you know, imposing linear ordering as, uh, as part of the key structure, okay? And so we think of these as, as binary, you know, non-planar non or non abstract binary rooted trees that have the leaves decorated by lexical items. Okay, lexical items, let's just say words for, for simplicity, they, those are gonna be eventually the words, the words of, the, of your sentence. And... I'm sorry, you say there's merge and then you talk about this, this collection of trees. Yes, that's right. So this is the, your, your structure formation operation is you know, the one that builds the trees starting from, from this. It's a sort of like a, a bottom-up bottom up construction. Okay. I, I'm going to say a little bit more, you know, more precise in a moment. I'm just, just giving the, the main idea now and I'll, I'll come to the precise definition in, in a moment. So, and okay, so you have this sort of computational 
you know, core computational process of structure formation. And I, I just want to make, make this point here, as I made it yesterday, that you know, there's similar kind of uh, computational structures of you know, you know, recursively generate um, a certain class of combinatorial objects, which are also sometimes parameterized by trees. That happens in physics in the context of, of the mathematical structure of quantum field theory. And, and those, those actually served pretty much as a model for the, the point of view on this linguistic model that I'm going to talk about. So this is a little bit of a no, sneak preview. And <clears throat> so there are, there are some aspects of this model of syntax that I will you know, focus on in a moment. And I'll, I'll give the, the mathematical definitions in a second. I just want to say what the main steps are. So there's, there's something that's called syntactic objects. They are these trees, right, that, that the structures that are uh, formed. And there's something that's called word spaces, which is where uh, various of these structures can be combined together and can be operated on. And there's something that's called accessible terms, which are the kind of substructures that you need to be able to access in order to do manipulations of sentences in, uh, in the use of language. And the, all, of, all of these, these uh, you know, aspects of the structure are combined together by an operation that is called merge that acts on workspaces. So it takes a workspace and gives you a new workspace. And so I, you know, a chain of such operations is what one calls a derivation in linguistics. And it's sort of, you can think of it as starting from a non-structured set of lexical items and building up a sentence where some of this building up operation also involves moving around the elements of, of the parts of the structures. And, and then, OK, the, this is just something, so far, this is just something that is this core mechanism that is somehow universal and not embodied in one particular language rather than another. And there's a, a further step, which is externalization. And there, the differences between the individual languages come in, and also there, somehow, the, the linear ordering that we you know, use in, in actually formulating sentences comes in. And in some sense, that's you know, uh, necessarily dictated by the fact of our anatomy, because we actually use language either through speech or, or through well, signing or, or writing. And all of these operations have a, have, have a time ordered kind of structure. So we necessarily are forced to you know, linearize this, this uh, process and, and we'll planarize the tree at some point in the process. And of course, this is done in a, in a way that is not no longer language independent, because word order changes according to languages. And that's where different word order structures come in for different languages. OK, so here we are. Now, that now let's, let's, let's say this thing again in a way that's more mathematically palatable. So um, the, the first kind of thing that I talked about is uh, what is called in linguistics syntactic objects. And in mathematics, is the free non-associative commutative magma on the set of lexical items. Okay, so this this is a, a very simple. This you know, magma as the the simplest possible kind of algebraic structures that you can form. So you start in this case, you start with a set, which is a finite, possibly large, but finite set of lexical items and, and something that's called syntactic features. I mean, just not be too too careful about details here. And but so you have some finite set, and then you have a binary operation that is commutative but non-associative. And you start forming new elements that are just de defined in this way, right? applying, you know, repeat by repeatedly applying this operation M. And this generates a set on which M acts. And, and this set is the, yeah, the, non the free non-associative commutative magma all generated by this, this initial set as so zero. And uh, it is um, commute, so it's free in the sense that you don't have any other relations except the commutativity relation. That's the only, the only one that you have. Okay. What, what, what is a magma? <coughs> 
Yeah, so magma is a set with like a single single operation, okay, which you know is you you don't you don't impose anything more than that. So you you don't ask for it to be in general associative, but in this case you ask for it to be commutative. So you're you're putting one one relation, but a priori you you don't require it to be you don't require it to have inverses. You don't. So it's not it's not a group. It's not so it's like the bare minimum, the bare minimum of algebraic structure that you can have. Yeah. And okay, so that's that's this thing. And so it's well known that this free non-associative commutative magma on a given set has another description, which is the, the so the elements of this magma are the non-planar binary rooted trees with leaves decorated by the element of the set that you start with. Yes. What is the set of lexical items supposed to be? Yeah, so this is a little bit, you know, uh, as, as I said, I, 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 I'm sort of skip putting some details under the rug because you know, in, in, in rough sense, you can think of them as words. But of course, you know, lexicon, of course, now is language dependent. So you, you can, if you want, think of it as some kind of like metal language lexicon, or you, know, you, you also want some kind of uh, syntactic features by which you keep track of well, what a certain le lexical item, what role it plays in, uh, in a sentence. So, I, there, there's a little bit of, uh, but you know, for for all practical purposes, you could say this is your your vocabulary, your your words. Okay. So, what is this commutative uh, operation for English language? Mm -hmm. What is this commutative operation M for the English, for English language? Right, so you, when you identify this as trees, right? What is this is saying is that you take you take two. No, non planar trees and rooted binary rooted trees so you, you may you, you take a new root and you hang them both by the root right this is this m operation that that's how you you make the the you know the bijective correspondence between the elements of the magma and the and the trees is to say like i start with the element of the set right that i that i build it out of and then if i have M of say alpha beta, I identify that with the cherry tree with leaves decorated by alpha and beta. And then if I if I write, yeah, this okay, let's me right here, right? You have alpha beta and this is M of alpha beta, right? And then you have alpha beta gamma. This is M of M of alpha beta gamma, but yeah, this is not not the same as alpha beta gamma because these are labeled, right? So this is M of alpha M of beta gamma, and then yeah, you see that there's. So implicitly, the other nodes are other elements of the, the of the given lexical set. Is that right? Uh, so the, the the thing so this produces structures where only only the leaves are labeled. The internal vertices are not labeled. Okay, so you can think of every internal vertex as as being one of these M operations that has two inputs and one output. That is this structure. But. They do correspond to some element of, of the set, of the magma set. It's just that they're unlabeled. Yeah, this is an element of the magma set. Oh, I see. The entire. Yeah. Right. Yeah, this is this. Yeah. This is this element of the magma set. Yeah. In terms of language, what does this mean? So should the thing that the maybe you could take them. this uh, phrase of Groucho Marx and maybe. This you drew trees before. Yeah. So the difference with that, the difference with that is that no, in that in that picture, I showed something where you label the internal vertices of the tree. That's a kind of an older notation that has to do with you no know, keeping track of yeah which roles parts of sentence do. It's it's no longer used in that form. 
there is a labeling algorithm that at some point will check whether you can propagate some of these as labels in intern on in the, of the internal vertices. And sometimes you can and sometimes you cannot. So part of this picture is that you have these, uh, this, this is called the free symmetric merge. Symmetric means that it's commutative so that the trees are not planar. But the, and free, of course, means that it's a free magma. But it also means that it kind of freely generates a lot of possible structures where you don't worry about trying to label the internal vertices. Some of these structures will allow you to label in a consistent way the internal vertices. And that is, you know, uh, I, I will talk about this you know, tomorrow in the, in, the, in the talk in the linguistics department. That is, you know, corresponds to a property in linguistics, which is to have a syntactic head. And, uh, and some of these will have one, and some of them will not. And so, you know, eventually, some of these freely generated structures of these of this free symmetric merge will have to die out because they are not parsable. They are not viable structures from the point of view of actually producing, you know, a linguistic outcome. And and this also is you expect that to be the case because you clearly have a combinatorial explosion here, and 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 a lot. But a lot of that stuff will die out at some point, and I'll, I'll come to that. You know how you model that. The operation is supposed to be commutative in alpha and beta. So if we were to interchange alpha and beta on this, like yeah, that, that's right. So the point is that this, tree? yeah, this point is that these trees are not planar, right? So this tree no is actually is actually the same as this tree, and that's that's that corresponds to saying that this operation is is commutative. Okay. So the fact that, that I'm not imposing a planar structure on the trees is exactly the fact that this is a commutative magma. But, uh, what does commutativity mean in terms of language? No, it's exactly this, this point that the, the actual ordering of words in a sentence is something that is language dependent because word ordering is language, has, you have different word ordering structures in different languages and is not part of this core computational generative process of syntax. It's something that happens at a later stage. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about, I, mean, I listed at the end of the stage something that is called externalization in linguistics. And it's actually where you pass to choosing a planar structure of the trees. But this is after structure formation is done. Structure formation is sort of independent because in a sense, structure formation should be a, a core operation that is not specific to one language is what your brain can compute about syntax. And your brain can compute syntax arbitrarily, you know, I mean, any, any, any human being can learn an arbitrary language, right? Human language. And, and this means that there is our core capacity for syntax generation has to be a priori independent of its embodiment in one particular language. And so this is what the commutativity means here. Okay. Uh, sorry, I have another piece of the yeah. question. So when you, when you talk about this free thing, are you thinking of MAB as a new kind of symbol? Yeah, yeah it's, it's, an, it's a new element. In, yeah, so it's, I, I'm not saying that this, op, this M is an operation on SO0. Right. It's just that SO0 generates. So M is an operation on what I call SO. And I'm just saying that SO0 is sufficient to generate mm -hmm. SO under that operation. Yeah. Is All right. Is there a difference in those two pictures? Because you can reach gamma directly in one, but you can't in the other. Yeah, exactly. This, 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 this is non-associative because yeah, this, this two are not not the same. Yeah, so it means, you see, it means that here there is a substructure that involves alpha and beta. If I, if I stop, my structure formation is bottom up, right? So here it means that there is a structure that involves alpha and beta, and then this is merged to a structure that only involves gamma. And here it means that there is a substructure that involves beta and gamma, and then I'm sort of merging it with a substructure that only involves alpha. And these are like conceptually two different things. Yeah. Okay. All right. We are all on board. Okay. Let's <laughs> 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 keep going. <laughs> all right. So what is between X and SO zero. 
Yeah, SO0, so you can do this with an arbitrary set X, right? So you always have this construction of, uh, if I give you a set, you can construct the free magma on that set. We, yeah, and so in this case, my set <coughs> is this lexical item set. All right, so next step uh, is workspaces. So workspaces are, by definition, mathematical definition, uh, forests. Forests of binary, non-planar binary rooted trees with leaves decorated by the set of lexical items. So, okay, binary forests. <clears throat> These are, in what sense you want to think of them as workspaces? Because you want to think of them as being like a scratch pad or of your current state in the process of a computation. So, you know, it, that, that's the picture you should have in mind. You start with an unstructured set of lexical items and you start to build structure with them. So I can decide that, okay, I, I look for an alpha and a beta and, a form, and I form a structure with those. And, and then I still have a bunch of other unstructured stuff there. And at the next step, I start to put together another piece of structure somewhere else. And at some point, these two will coalesce into a larger structure and so on. So at each of these steps, I have available a collection of things, some of which are trees because of the structure that I have already formed. At that, at that step, and others are still like, well, they're also trees, but they're trees that consist of a single leaf with a, with a label and nothing else. And then I keep you know, building until I reach the point where I have a single sentence, which means like a, a workspace that contains a single tree, okay? A tree is a connected forest. Okay, so, um, so, Fine, this is what workspaces are. So if you think of it this way, this process that I've described, that you, you know, gradually build up structures by you know, building substructures and combining them together, is an operation right, that you keep doing. And this operation has an input, which is a, a workspace, or so a forest, and has an output, which is a new forest. So I'm describing an operation on the set of forests. Okay. All right, so how do I make this operation? Okay, I have to introduce another thing before I describe what the operation does. Because I don't just, so the, the thing I described so far like, is something like this. I have you know, a workspace that consists of like some bunch of uh, you know, leaves with labels and nothing else. And I can decide that, okay, I start forming one structure here, and you know, I start forming another structure there, and, and then I decide that, I don't know, this will, will go together with like this one, and then, I don't know, this will go together with this one, and so on, right? Okay, this is one thing, but this is not all that I, that I wanna do. And there's something else, right, that, that uh, is part of how this operation will work, and it's sort of a natural part of this, how this operation will work, which is also that if I have a structure that's already formed, and then I have something else, right, I, could, I also want to do something, and which is, you know, reaching into this structure for some substructure there and extract it and, and, and move it. And why do, why, why, where is this coming from? So where, where, why am I bringing in this thing? So empirical, empirical linguistic reason for this is that, you know, when we, when we have sentences, you know, we, we don't just like produce sentences, we also modify sentences. And for example, you know, it's very easy to see that if you, you know, uh, for example, form, in, well, if you speak in English, you form a question, you, you take some part of your sentence and you move it somewhere else. Or when you form like a, the, the passive voice, you have to move some pieces of the sentence to a different position. And so there is this movement or transformations that has to be part of, your, your, of how the structure is is used and it also has to be part of how the structure is built because if you want to build a larger structure, you might have to first move part of the structure that you have and then combine it with other structure. Yes? Can you characterize that as operations or relations on the magma generated by this, this, this small syntactical set of symbols? 
You can view them that way, but it's more convenient to actually see them all as operations on the set of workspaces. Because what you're doing is like you have all the, all the pieces that you are trying to assemble, and some of them you, for example, transform them first and then assemble them with something else. So, but can you think of the workspaces as an analog of like the free operat? Yeah, it, I'm, I'm going to get to that, and of course, there's there's a kind of. A, I mean, I'm going to I'm going to use this. What, what I'm going to present is, of course, has an opera description behind it, but I'll I'll present it in a sort of Hopf algebra point of view, which, of course, you can say it's the incidence of algebra of an opera. But yeah, that's okay. Um, all right. So accessible terms are the kind of substructure that you want to reach for when you do this movement, and so. You know, the way that you define them is that, well, either they are an entire component that you take and you, you use it to you know, combine with something else, or there's something that's deeper into one of the components. And so essentially what you, what you want to say in terms of the structure of the tree is that you look at one of the internal vertices of the tree and then you take everything that's hanging below that vertex. And that is an accessible term. So if I have a, a, a rooted tree, binary rooted tree, any of the internal vertices or also, well, you can also consider an accessible term that consists of just one of the leaves. But anyway, any known root vertex is an accessible term. So it's a substructure that you can extract. All right. Okay, so we have all these ing ingredients well, available, and and the question is, what is the algebraic structure that relates all of them? And so I'm going to argue that the natural kind of algebraic structure that describes the 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 role of all these ingredients that I have described so far is a Hopf algebra. So why, why is that? Okay, so first of all, what, what is a Hopf algebra? So it's a, it's a very natural mathematical structure that uh, encodes operation of composition and decomposition, compatible operation of composition and decomposition. So a Hopf algebra is two operations, a product and a coproduct. A product is telling you how you put things together and the co-product is telling you how you break them apart. And uh, there is some compatibility with these two, between these two operations. But you know, this is something I was mentioning yesterday, and I'm going to say it more precisely today. It's saying that these two operations are compatible is not saying that they are inverse operations of each other. So the way that you decompose things can, and in this case is, more sophisticated or more or richer than the way that you put them together and or in some cases it can be vice versa. There, there is a compatibility between the two that's necessary and I will show what that compatibility is as part of the, the axioms of what a half algebra is. But I warn you that the compatibility is not that these two operations are inverses of each other. Okay. All right, so here's kind of the picture, right? Um, Composition takes has two inputs and one output. The output is how you put, put this together. And decomposition, so yeah, one cannot actually see anything here, but I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll come to something that, that you can see. So, but anyway, decomposition is all the possible ways that one can break apart a structure. But in this picture here, as I said, it's sort of deceiving because the way that you are putting things together is actually just opposite to the way that you, you break them apart. And that's, that's more restrictive than you actually want it to be. So let's just get into what the actual definition is. So a Hopf algebra is a vector space over some field that has two operations, a multiplication and a co-multiplication. Multiplication has two inputs and one output, co-multiplication and one input and two outputs. There is a unit for multiplication, there is a co-unit for co-multiplication, and there is an antipode which is sort of like an inverse. Well, this, the, this, this formalization of algebra has a lot to do with, with groups. There's a specific sense in which it's related to groups, and antipode is sort of like the inverse of a group. And multiplication is associated and co-multiplication is co-associative. I'll come in a moment to say what that means, but you, you obviously know what that should mean. It means that these operations behave well under iteration. That's what you know, associativity and, and co-associativity are saying. And 
the antipod relates all these elements in a, in, of the, the Hopf algebra into a single relation. And you know, there's compatibilities in the sense that co-multiplication and co-unit are morphism of algebras. Multiplication and unit are morphism of co-algebras. So there's, there's like this two complete symmetry between these different sets of structures. And so when some, the, all of these, these rules, as I will show in a moment, are expressed visually in terms of diagrams. And the, anything that satisfies this list of properties, you can call it a good pair of composition, or compatible composition and decomposition operations. So, you know, multiplication is associative and, and has a unit. This is the usual you know, idea of what multiplication does. And co-multiplication is co-associative and kind of a co-unit. And of course, you see that what I'm doing here is just to reverse all the errors. So in fact, you know, all algebras are have the duality in this sense that, that reflects everything. And so every Hopf algebra has a dual of algebra where multiplication becomes co-multiplication and vice versa. Okay. So, uh, and of course you can express this commutativity of diagrams in terms of, in terms of specific equations like the co-associativity equation that you can write in that form. And the compatibility of product of coproduct, as I said, is not that, uh, Applying, say, product first and coproduct after this sort of would be giving you the identity or vice versa. The compatibility is that, in a sense, if you apply product first and coproduct after, is like applying coproduct first and product after. But of course, you have to be careful about a few things. Like, first of all, that you go between, you know, number, you change the number of outputs, right? And, or inputs and outputs. So, and also, you know, the, in the coproduct, so the, co the coproduct has one input and two outputs. So you can say that it has like a left channel and a right channel, right? It goes to H tensor H. And, and the two parts are really like the two pieces of your decomposition. There's one type of piece that goes on the left channel, one type of piece that goes to the right channel. And usually these are, don't play a symmetric role, meaning it, you're not requiring your half algebra to be co-commutative, so you cannot switch the, these, two, these two outputs. And for that reason, when you, when you wanna go this way, right, you wanna, and you're recombining things, you're, you're decomposing and then you're recombining, you wanna combine like with like. So you have to do a shift so that the two left channels will be combined together and the two right channels will be combined together so that if you have different type of objects on the left and the right, you will combine like with like. Okay, so this is the compatibility condition. And okay, so, so this is the formal definition of half algebras. And the antipod is relating all of these operations together into a single relation. And it looks like, so usually, usually the antipod is, a, is an additional stronger constraint on, so a bi-algebra is just something that has all these other properties that are listed up to now, except this antipod. And this antipod is what makes it the, the bi-algebra an actual half algebra. And usually this is a much, an additional strong constraint but there's a class of op algebras which include all the combinatorial op algebras that are associated to combinatorial objects like the trees that I'm talking about here. And for this class of combinatorial op algebras, the antipode is really not an additional constraint. It already comes to you for free from the bi-algebra structure because these are sort of graded and connected and so there's a, the, the coproduct has just this, this primitive part where you, you know, don't decompose anything so either you, so if this is the part of the decomposition, it's just everything and nothing, nothing and everything. But then all the other terms where you're actually decomposing some non-trivial ways, they're all of lower degree. And so this allows you to define this antipode inductively over degrees, and so it's really not an additional constraint. And so for that reason, because I am in that case, I will actually never really talk about the antipode because it's, uh, it's there for free and I don't have to worry about it. Okay. All right, so workspaces are a half algebra. That's, that's the punchline that I, that I wanna say at this point. 
So of course, you know, the, first, the first thing is that I said the Hopf algebra to begin with is a vector space. So when I say the workspaces are a Hopf algebra, I'm implicitly saying, because you know, I define workspaces as a set, the set of you know, binary forests or binary rooted trees. So I, of course, I'm taking the vector space that's spanned by that set. And so I, you know, and, and that's, of course, a convenient way to say, to, that to, a convenient thing to do because your co-product is giving you all the ways of decomposing your object. And in general, you have a list of different ways of decomposing your object. And then you look at this whole thing as a single term, as a sum. And so they, what that naturally you know, requires working in the, in the vector space of a formal linear combination of elements in this set. So we have this vector space of workspaces. And the product is just a very simple operation that assembles your workspaces. So it's the, the thing that takes, takes you no, know, it's the disjoint union, right? The forest is a disjoint union of trees. And so I can take two forests and form a new forest by taking their disjoint union. So the product is this very simple operation. It's just, it's simple, it's, it's commutative, it's associative, you know, it's, it has, a, well, the empty set, the formal empty forest as a unit. It's, uh, it's, it's a, it, so the product is an extremely simple thing. So in turn, as an algebra, this is another way of saying that as an algebra is the, is the polynomial algebra on the, the forest. Yeah. And, the part that is interesting is the co-product. Uh -huh. So, okay, so here, here's an important question <laughs> about this talk. There were sort of uh, conflicting information that I received about how long this talk should be. <laughs> so, I... Um, so it's supposed to it's supposed to stop. It stopped ten minutes ago. Oh, I see. Okay, so some of some of my information was not exactly correct. So um, let seriously. Yeah, hmm? people do go over time. Okay, so I'm gonna just try try to finish this this description and then I, and then I will stop there. And uh, I'm giving tomorrow another talk in the in the linguistics department. Where I'll say a few more things you know about some of these things. So let, let me just finish this, this description. So the, the, the interesting part was where you described the co-product. And as I said, you, one thing that you could do is just say that the way you decompose the, the trees is by not, decomp not, uh, not looking at any substructure. So the trees are indecomposable. They are, you know, being, saying that it's indecomposable means that you only have the primitive part of the co-product. And then of course, because it's a morphism of algebra, for forest it would just be the product. And, and then, you know, for a forest, it would just be a partition of the workspace. You, you, you separate it out into two pieces. So it would be exactly the inverse of the product. But this would only, so this would account for what linguists call external merge, but it will not account for this kind of movement that I want to have, this type of transformations that I want to have. But there is a more natural and more interesting co-product, which is the one where you extract substructures. And you can think of them as, you know, so you start to cut the tree into pieces, and you have the, you use this admissible cuts, and what falls off is a forest, so, your, your left side of the output of the co-product contains a forest of accessible terms. The right side contains what remains, what remains attached to the root. There's, there's a little bit of care in defining exactly what this remainder term is in order to have co-associativity, and I'm not gonna talk about it. But the thing is that you can have this more interesting co-product. And then if you can have this more interesting co-product, the, the operation that linguists call merge and that takes workspaces into new workspaces is described in the following way. You, you first apply the co-product that you know, displays for you all the material that's available for calculation, you mean all the accessible terms. You zoom in on a particular one that you want to use, and then you, you graft together the forest that you have on the left-hand side of this into a new tree. And then you recompose the old workspaces using the product. So you're using the, the co-product to decompose. You, you form this new grafting tree, and then you use the product to compose again. And 
so the, the, there are some you know, other aspects here. Of course, you, you zoom in only on the terms that have this binary merge, so where this grafting only involves two trees. A priori, you could use some more general type of grafting like this. There are some other operations, for example, something that's called form set that uses this other material that you have available in the co-product. But the, the basic structure is this, this merge operations here. Okay, so um, I'm gonna, yeah, have to stop here. Uh, so I, I just wanna wanna maybe say one thing that, um, for example, the the way the fact that you formalize it in this way in terms of the uh, of uh, Hopf algebra and and its properties allows you to. You know, look from this algebraic perspective as some questions that that you have in linguistics. Like, for example, you know, linguists have uh, the the question of whether some more complicated type of uh, operations on trees are necessary or not. Like, there's something that's called late merge in the in the linguistics literature, which would correspond to making insertions not no not this kind of merging at the root like I've described here, but something more like what I have in this picture where you insert a structure at some internal point in the tree. And, and there, there are some examples in linguistics where you have some parts of sentence that kind of behave as if they shouldn't be there, and one says, well, they are late merged to something like this. And, and so some of the question is, do you really need this late merge? Is it compatible with the other structure? Is it something that could be just in other ways described in terms of this basic merge operation that I described before? And so you know, it, there, there's an answer to this that you can get just purely out of the algebra. I'll, I'll just say this and I stop, I'll stop with that. So I just want to give you one, one, one example of how you use this algebraic you know, formalism. So what is this kind of operation? What, what sense does it have in terms of this of algebra structure that I just described? So there's an associated other structure that lives you know, around my half algebra, which is a Lie algebra. A Lie algebra has a bracket that's uh, you know, anti-symmetric and satisfies the Jacobi identity. One can express this uh, bracket in terms of another simpler operation, which, which more primitive operation, which is called the pre lee structure. And you know, the, in, if you have this kind of algebra that I'm talking about, this graded connected of algebra, there's, there's a Lie algebra that's naturally associated to it, which is the primitive elements of the dual Hopf algebra. And what is this structure? Well, it's exactly the insertions at the internal vertices. So it's exactly the insertion of this form that I'm describing here. So the, this, uh, this pre lee structure takes, makes all the possible insertions at internal points in the tree. And, you know, and one can sh show that it does satisfy this, uh, this Lie algebra properties, and it is indeed the, this Lie algebra that's associated to the Hopf algebra that I just described. And you know, to conclude with that, what does this say? Well, this says that this is completely determined by the Hopf algebra that I just described. So in particular, it gives you an a priori reason for, for, for a priori like algebraic reasons why you expect that this late merge is not an extension of merge, but is something that is already there and is already describable in terms of this basic, more basic merge structure that I described before. And of course, this this skips on quite a lot of details, but you know, so this this is a common an example for the linguists in the audience of you know when uh, when people, for example, propose that you should you should uh, use this late merge when there's some kind of violation of certain condition in theory when you do movement and something behaves as if you shouldn't be there. But in fact, I mean, sort of went through a bunch of these these examples and you know, with with uh, linguists you know, in, uh, in Utrecht, in Hoibrecht, and we saw that, in, like in most in, in all of these examples you can look at, you can really still make sense of these cases without having to resort to this late merge and in terms of the of the usual merge that you already have. So it's a case where so I'll stop with this. I just wanted to make an example where you know the the algebraic formalism is sort of a priori telling you that certain things are not 
new extension of the structure that you already have, but they are already part of the structure that you already that you have because of its its algebraic properties. And so on the basis of that, you can sort of expect that there should be also a kind of linguistic explanation for why it should be already part of the structure that you already have. So that's one of the ways in which you can use this, this, uh, this type of formalism. OK, so I will stop here because <laughs> I'm already over time <laughs> sometime. So one thing that I did not have time to talk about is uh, the externalization picture, how you model passing from these uh, abstract binary rooted trees that are non-planar to the actual you know, embodiment in, in specific languages. And that also has a kind of sort of nice mathematical description. You can think of it as a correspondence in, in the mathematical sense. And, and it's, uh, yeah, so there, there's kind of a, a, a sort of other interesting story about you know, the linguistic properties of this externalization that you can deduce from the algebraic properties of this correspondence. And, and so on. So the, anyway, this is the main idea of, of how, how one can use this type of this point of view. So you try to show that the, a lot of empirical uh, reasons why you build the linguistic model in a certain way are actually uh, determined by the constraints of the, of the algebraic model. So that in some sense, you, you, a lot of requirements, you don't have to impose them as you know, based on empirical evidence, but you, you can actually say that they follow from the, the, the algebraic structure itself, and then you know, you, they match what you expect from empirical reasons, but you're not like a priori imposing them on the basis of those. Okay.